Well, that's a great question to start with. If we're in an economy that doesn't have a job guarantee, then typically governments will look to the unemployment rate as a proxy measure of how the economy is travelling. Now, the problem with that is, of course, that concept has become infested with the notion of a natural rate of unemployment or a Nehru, a non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. And the problem with that then is that the ideological predispositions of the mainstream have created estimates of the Nehru that are elevated beyond what the irreducible unemployment rate is that's consistent with stable inflation. And so as a consequence, if the unemployment rate approaches this upwardly biased Nehru, well then policymakers think that the economy is getting closer to full capacity and they start tightening policies. And that's been particularly the case in this re modern era where uh, macroeconomic policy is biased towards the use of monetary policy and a, a, a disposition to uh, bias fiscal policy towards surpluses. And of course, central banks have then uh, uh, again infested by another concept about expectations have then become biased in their policy making towards this forward looking approach and so that they don't actually wait for the unemployment rate to get down to their estimated Nehru they actually start tightening policy before that. Now recently the Federal Reserve in America has altered that position because they've finally worked out that it's a ridiculous way to run policy because it leaves the unemployment rate at elevated levels unnecessarily with all of the consequent losses. Now in a job guarantee world the situation would be different because the last person who walks in the door for to get a job guarantee job tells the government in terms of its other policy settings how much stimulus is necessary to maintain that loose full employment. Now if the government starts observing the job guarantee pool contracting rather quickly well then it's got a very reliable indication that employment growth is very strong. It knows then that the economy is pushing closer and closer to full capacity and at that point it knows that it has to monitor its net spending relative to the spending and saving decisions of the non-government sector. This question is often posed and the answer is straightforward. There are no fundamental differences between the main MMT economists particularly the original team and then the, the, the other economists that came after that team. Now, on, on all of the substantive core MMT points, there is no disagreement. There are differences in style and differences in emphasis uh, depending upon the predilection of the particular economist. But if we put together all of the main MMT propositions, we would all give them a tick in a consistent way. Now, I, the question asked about the relevance of Hyman Minsky. Well, the point is that if you go back to the start of the MMT project, where Warren Mosler and myself were in communication, and Randy Ray was also in that conversation and he expressed a view that he was interested in some of these ideas and had to think about them a bit and soon realised that he was on board too. And it's no surprise then that Randy would have interpreted some of the things we were talking about in terms of his prior interactions with Hyman Minsky because he was Hyman Minsky's PhD student. But it's totally incorrect to say 
that the fundamental ideas that began in that, in that early communication between the three of us, Randy, myself and Warren, were in any way influenced by Hyman Minsky's work. They weren't. Warren and I were never influenced by Hyman Minsky's work. And for those who came later, who say it's all in Hyman Minsky, that's an incorrect statement. And, the, and if you then ask the question, would you be able to extrapolate Hyman Minsky's intellectual work into what we now call MMT? The answer is clearly no. There are elements of it. That's true. As there are elements of a lot of the progressive or heterodox work. But if you extrapolate where Minsky was going towards the end of his career, he was a sound finance person. He was becoming worried about deficits and in, in, in inflation. And if you extrapolated that, you wouldn't have got close to where I think MMT is. The German physicist Max Planck once said, paradigm shift one funeral at a time. At least that was a shortened version of a longer quote. And what he was, re was referring to was the fact that academic hierarchies can become resistant to change when a new set of ideas come along that appear to explain reality and do a better job than the older ideas which appear to be in a degenerative phase. That is, that their predictions don't stack up with reality. And he was referring to this idea that Irving Yarnes introduced into social psychology of groupthink, that groups form this destructive pattern behaviour to reinforce their own inner world through promotion processes, appointment processes, research grants, funding, all of that. And the senior academics have a much more at stake than the younger ones. The younger ones are sort of playing ball because that's their hope that they'll get promoted if they, if they stick to the story. Whereas the older academics, the senior professors, their reputations are at stake and they will protect those reputations and resist new knowledge. Now this bears upon the notion of whether MMT is winning. It's not really a competition, but I see it often said these days that oh, MMT is winning. Well, this is because some mainstream uh, media outlet reports something about MMT. Now the only way in which a paradigm shifts is not whether some news outlet reports about, uh, talks about it or whether social media tweets its head off about it. When the paradigm has shifted is when the senior professors accept the new knowledge, incorporate it into their teaching and research programs and the younger ones incorporate it into their teaching and research programs. And then that feeds out into graduates go into policy making areas, central banks, treasuries, and that's when the paradigm shifts. We're a long way from that. Now, whether it's the resistance currently is through ignorance or conspiracy is a good question. And of course, it, it's both because the younger academics, the the ones who are in the mid of the hierarchy, uh, the, the ones who haven't established necessarily a, a, a solid uh, research record, they tend to be the textbook teachers. And they tend to go with whatever the textbooks dictate. The senior academics, the so-called high-profile professors that are quoted often and uh, the luminaries of the profession. It's a different matter altogether. And we have a quote once from Paul Samuelson, who more or less said, 
that it's better to keep everybody in the dark about what the truth is, about the capacities of the government, about the uh, operations of the monetary system, because then the public won't place demands on their politicians. And that type of insight, which has been repeated subsequently by other commentators, lets you know that they know what's going on, but they've got a cosy world, their reputations are at stake, and they'll resist at all costs, even if they know that what they're hanging on to is inferior to the new knowledge that's contesting the paradigmic space. <music>